Well, hello and welcome to our second discussion on population today, uh, an issue that is ignored by politicians and our media at our peril. Um, in fact, the, this is a population uh, theme day and um, population is one of the key stresses mentioned in the World Scientist Warning to Humanity. And just pray seeing this very briefly, this um, stressor warning says that population, world population must be stabilized and ideally reduced um, with, within a framework that ensures social integrity. Um, so anyway, I'm delighted to welcome Dave Gardner, Executive Director of World Population Balance, uh, speaking to us today from Colorado. The United States has a pop more population concern organizations than other countries, but in my view, World Population Balance offers a realistic and engaging um, vision in, in any transition to a sustainable future. So over to you, Dave. Thanks very much. It's a pleasure to be here. I really want to thank Scientists Warning Europe for putting this week of outstanding sessions together and particularly for having a day uh, dedicated to the population subject. You don't often see that. Uh, I'm going to try to leave plenty of time for questions and discussion. If anyone in the audience is a skeptic, I especially invite you and encourage you to challenge me. I really welcome all questions. We're really busy writing the book on how to destabilize a climate. Uh, there are two big fundamental drivers of carbon emissions. One is our pursuit of economic growth or consumption. And when we're, when we're not busy pursuing GDP growth, growth, we're chasing the good life and ignoring its consequences. Number two is pursuit of population growth, the number of us doing the consuming. And when we're not pursuing and celebrating that, we're at least avoiding addressing it. Uh, thanks to our pursuit of economic and population growth, we are in overshoot. The scale of the human enterprise, the size of our economy, and the size of our population has outgrown the planet. That's really disrupting our climate, it's destroying biodiversity, and damaging all our life-supporting ecosystems. Globally, we've burned through a year's worth of the planet's regenerative capacity in less than eight months. Now that's not a matter of opinion. There's really no shortage of scientific reports documenting this fact. Uh, let's talk about consumption and population for a minute. These are the major factors that determine impact on the planet. How many people and how we're behaving. Our footprint on the planet is like the area of a rectangle. Consumption times population equals impact. It's kind of a simplified version of the IPAT formula many of you may be familiar with. And you know, technology is missing from my graphic here. Technology does play a role here too, but the really big drivers, if you really wanna simplify it down to the basics are consumption and population. Now that impact plays out in biodiversity loss, depletion of vital resources and carbon emissions for sure. You can't ignore the length of a rectangle when computing its area, but you also can't ignore the width. If you're shrinking one, but growing the other, you're in an unsustainable pattern. But many people do want to ignore the length of that rectangle. Addressing overpopulation is an uncomfortable subject. So people do go out of their way to make it unpleasant to advocate for a sustainable population. I think that's a minority of people, but nevertheless, they do that. Uh, discomfort with the idea of addressing overpopulation has really driven a lot of people to insist that we can get out of overshoot or solve the climate crisis by just changing one dimension of the rectangle while the other dimension keeps growing. Now, don't get me wrong, overconsumption is a huge problem, but these people insist that overconsumption is the problem and we should ignore overpopulation. And I'd like to explain why I don't think that is a, a viable path to take, uh, but let's explore it. Let's find out. Can we do that? Can we solve overshoot? and minimize climate disruption by shrinking our consumption while our population balloons to 11 billion, perhaps. Now, there are two levers we can pull if we're ignoring the overpopulation lever. 
we can change our lifestyles to reduce our level of consumption, or we can develop and, and adopt new technology. And uh, since we're really, uh, this being a pre-COP kind of conference, I want to emphasize carbon emissions a lot in my talk today. So we would be talking about renewable energy and or carbon capture and sequestration for technology to deal with climate disruption. Uh, can technology save the day? Well, Post Carbon Institute fellows Richard Heinberg and David Fridley analyzed the needed shift to renewable energy, and they published their findings in Our Renewable Future. They found technology alone is very unlikely to get us within our carbon emissions budget for even a two degree world. They wrote, we should aim for a sustainable level of energy and material consumption, which on average is significantly lower than at present. Now, these are not the only experts that I respect uh, who've done the, the homework and feel that uh, technology is not the miracle that some people hope for. It has a whole a role to play, but it won't keep us from having to deal with some of the other hard work to, be, to do. So how about skinnying up our lives then? Well, Robin Maynard, who I also really want to thank, uh, I don't know, Robin, if you're in the audience, but he delivered a great presentation earlier earlier today and uh, really have a lot of respect for Population Matters and uh, enjoy collaborating with that organization whenever possible. He mentioned the Lund University study of carbon reduction actions. Uh, in this study, they analyzed many of the actions that we can and we should take. Now, I left a label off of the big bubble. What do you think that big bubble is? By adding one fewer human being to the mix, in one fail swoop, you get the full savings of every one of those other bubbles. And it's not just one human being's carbon footprint, because one human being can beget another. So that 58.6 tons of annual emission savings actually accounts for portions of emissions from a few subsequent generations, as it should. This action is incredibly effective. But oh yeah, we're trying to ignore population, we're trying to figure out if we can get out of this quandary without having to address that uncomfortable subject. So let's a little, look a little closer at our consumptive behavior. Now, we all know that air travel is hard on the climate. Are airlines going to voluntarily cut their fleets by 80% or even 50%? Will any government require them to do that? Are we going to convince our neighbors, friends, and family to give up flying? Are we ourselves going to give up flying? Well, we can try, and we really should. However, what would happen if you cut the airline's market in half? If we cut the world's population in half, isn't it likely we'd see half the flights? How about the oil industry? Are BP and ExxonMobil going to volunteer to leave their assets in the ground? Are we giving up our cars at a frantic pace? Well, we should. But imagine if we just took away half of the market for BP and ExxonMobil's uh, most valued asset, oil. Still, if it's just too uncomfortable to inform people about overpopulation and encourage informed family-sized decisions, let's do some math. Let's see exactly what we need to do on the consumption side. Uh, let's just do some rough back of the cocktail napkin math here. Global Footprint Network analysis tells us that we're approaching two planet living, making twice the renewable resource demands than the Earth can sustainably deliver. So how do we get from two planet living back to a sustainable one planet level? Well, global economic throughput is the best indicator of our level of consumption. So we need to cut the global economy in half. So that ends us, we, get up, we end up with $43.3 trillion US if we cut the economy in half. Now let's divide that by about seven and a half billion people just to get us into the ballpark. That leaves us with $5,750 US per person. That, that would be your, at your annual income if you were living a sustainable life. We all need to skinny up our lives that much if we're going to get back into balance on this planet and do some one planet living. And that's just a snapshot of today. If the human population grows, according to the UN's most likely scenario, to 11 billion at the turn of the century, and you do this math, we would each need to live on $3,700 a year. 
Now, I borrowed this graphic from Terry Sparr, executive producer of the new film, Eight Billion Angels, which I recommend highly. He estimates this is the way we'd have to live to be in sustainable balance without reducing population. Now, if you're attending this session, maybe you're willing to give this a try. Uh, we ought to be trying to get as close to that as we can. Um, but I can guarantee you, your friends and neighbors and colleagues aren't going to go for this. It's pretty clear that we need to work on both, reducing our profligate consumption and reducing human numbers. And I think in the overdeveloped world, and I never say developed world because we in the industrialized world got carried away. We overachieved, we are overdeveloped. So that's what I'll be calling it today, the overdeveloped world. We've got a lot of room to eliminate a lot of excess consumption, but this math shows us just how extreme it has to be if we just can't get comfortable talking about and solving overpopulation at the same time. Now, so far, we haven't shown much inclination to shrink our consumption. Globally, we've more than doubled economic throughput per person over the last 60 years. Meanwhile, during the same time period, we've actually cut the global average family size in half. Women by and large are more than happy to devote less of their lives to changing diapers and more to college degrees, careers, and making a difference in the world. Now, I'm not saying we shouldn't work damn hard to shrink our individual and collective consumptive footprints. And I'm not saying that motherhood uh, isn't a very valuable uh, contribution to society either. But we're crazy if we choose to ignore the low hanging fruit. But you might ask, well, if this is already happening, then what more is there to do? Why are we here? Well, because we're not celebrating this enough. We should celebrate this and we should work to accelerate it. And we also need to work to oppose and resist those who try to convince us that this is something to be alarmed about. Plus, we haven't bent the curve yet. Our numbers are still climbing. You and demographers think it's most likely that world population will peak near 11 billion around the beginning of the next century. We've got a global fertility rate today of about 2.4 and it's dropping. If we could pick up the pace, we could make our population peak sooner and lower and contracting our population in the overdeveloped world will give us immediate carbon footprint benefits. Let's talk about the power of exponential growth. No discussion of population is complete without it. Uh, now we're currently growing a little more than 1% a year in global population. Let's just to keep it simple. Let's assume we maintain 1% annual growth the rest of this century. If we do that, we would be adding 78 million this year. 10 years later, we would be adding over 86 million people in that year. In 2050, we would add 105 million people in a year. And in 2100, we would add 173 million people. Just 1% growth, but it's 1% of a bigger number. It takes people to make people. Now, at a 1% annual growth rate, you double the population in 72 years. Now, think about this. If we were to just end growth and just stabilize the population 72 years earlier, we would stabilize at half the population. These graphs show how in 100 years, we could actually be back in the neighborhood of a sustainable world population. A one child average gets us to about 3 billion in 2100. I'm not saying we could achieve that one child average instantly, but it's mathematically possible. Now, I think that's quicker than most people would have guessed. But of course, 100 years is still a long time, especially if we're racing the clock on climate change. We don't have 100 years. So does that mean that embracing smaller families is not an effective climate action? Well, we're adding about 80 million people to the planet every year today. Nearly half of all pregnancies are unintended. So what if we just cut that 80 million in half to 40 million people? And let's say next year we add 40 million net gain to the planet instead of 80 million. At today's average carbon equivalence footprint of six tons per year, that would shave 240 million metric tons of carbon emissions next year. And then the year after that, and the year after that. Is that significant? Well, it's equivalent to the carbon sequestered by over one and a half billion acres of forest. It's like closing 50 coal powered power plants. 
It's like taking 100 million, 100 million gas powered autos off the roadways. <clears throat> if those 40 million fewer births are in the overdeveloped, over consuming world, then the carbon reduction would be even greater. Inspiring and enabling the public to have the number of new carbon footprints could be a good public project and public policies could aid that. But achieving that is really a matter of individual action. Young adults choosing to be child free or to have just one child. We should celebrate that and we should be working to remove all barriers to that becoming the new norm. So how can we inspire and support this action? World Population Balance has been working for over 25 years just to raise overpopulation awareness. We realized about a year and a half ago that we're seeing exactly what we've been trying to set the stage for. The average family size has been dropping and it looks like that progress is accelerating. So we thought it was time to update our message. Let's acknowledge this progress and celebrate it. Hopefully in so doing, we would quicken the pace of that progress. So we crowdfunded and launched the One Planet, One Child billboard campaign this year. We started with billboards that celebrate the small family choice. This campaign is intended to eliminate what we call overpopulation illiteracy among the general public, policymakers, and journalists. We need to give young people, young couples around the world, good information so that they're aware of overshoot. And we want to encourage and empower them to make an informed family size decision. Now, when we expanded the campaign in Vancouver, Canada, I'm showing you some, some of the billboards in Vancouver, we tried more direct statements about overpopulation. And I'll tell you, we found that uh, the public is a little less ready for those more direct statements. Uh, but we got notice, that's for sure. Overnight, our OnePlanetOneChild.org campaign website went from a few hundred visitors today to 10,000, over 10,000, over 20,000 even on one day. Um, and that crashed our website. We got over 100 broadcast mentions. One news story got 11,000 social shares in one day. 57 social media posts reached a quarter of a million people the day after these news stories broke. But as I mentioned, not all of the attention was positive. There were some accusations of racism, eugenics, eco-fascism, anti-family or being anti-Bible. Now, we anticipated some of that, but I'll admit that the volume and the level of vitriol took us a bit by surprise. But let me be clear, racism, eugenics, and eco-fascism are invalid assumptions about today's sustainable population movement. There have been mistakes and human rights abuses in some past efforts to rein in population growth, but that doesn't mean overpopulation isn't a problem we need to address. And it doesn't mean that any effort to deal with the problem is gonna be a rerun of those past mistakes. So our campaigns are intended to spark more public conversations and better media coverage so we can educate everyone that we can solve overpopulation voluntarily, ethically, and respectfully of human and civil rights. Let me assure you, there is no place for racism, eugenics, or eco-fascism in the modern sustainable population movement. Overpopulation is not a problem exclusive to the developing world. There's a role for everyone around the world in solving this crisis. There's no need to blame anyone, target anyone, legislate any government edicts, or otherwise dictate someone's family size. We just need to encourage informed family size decisions, improve access to family planning, and celebrate and support small families freely chosen. Notably, a member of Canada's parliament heard about our ads in Vancouver and took exception to our message in remarks he made to the House of Commons. He announced that he planned to run a counter campaign on Vancouver buses. And this leads me to one major obstacle that we all need to overcome contracting populations and just declining fertility rates in nations that have yet to contract have given rise to depopulation panic. Now, this is especially common among economists, business leaders, and politicians. I wish we had a vaccine for this. 
uh, they're afraid we're not going to have enough workers. We'll have fewer consumers. Robust GDP growth will be history. We won't have enough taxpayers to fund pensions and social programs for the elderly. There won't be enough young people to care for all the old people. Well, here's the truth. You might call this Population 101 for politicians. Eternal economic growth is not physically possible. An economy needs only to be big enough to meet the needs of the population. A smaller economy serves a smaller population just fine. If, you got to, if you're trying to solve this problem of this temporary larger cohort of elderly people, adding young people to solve the problem just gives you a bigger problem in future generations. Future generations of elderly will be bigger and then you'll, you know, you're in a pyramid scheme forever. Now, this imbalance of more elderly people and fewer youth as we begin to contract our population is just temporary. Um, but the challenges are, some of the challenges are real, some of them are imagined. Uh, for example, funds for social programs can be shifted from the smaller youth cohort to the temporarily larger elderly cohort. Problem solved. And of course, uh, people are very productive members of society well past age 65 these days. So uh, much of the alarm is overblown. But I'll tell you, a contracting population, it's more challenging to the pro-growth mindset than it really is to actually running a civilization. Uh, but I'll admit we do have a system that we've evolved that is so dependent on growth that a population in contraction mode will present a few challenges. But these challenges will be quite small compared to the dire consequences of driving human population or human civilization, rather, right off a cliff. Now, a surprising number of countries are trying hard to get women to breed more taxpayers, workers, and consumers. This is an addict desperate for another fix. The addiction is to economic growth, and population is a pretty essential ingredient. I find this just astonishing. The behavior we need is happening but policymakers just can't imagine a post-growth world. And journalists programmed from birth to believe in the universal goodness of growth report on declining birth rates as a problem rather than a solution. Now, the good news is that so far women aren't buying it. Government subsidies of procreation are not having much of an effect, thankfully. But growth-addicted politicians are turning to one other source to supply their habit, immigration. Now, let me just suggest that it's one thing to provide asylum or welcome climate refugees into your country. It's quite another to seek and exploit migrants as economic pawns to grow your economy or to pay taxes to balance the budget. To get into sustainable balance, we need all nations to be in population contraction mode. There can't be a few nations manufacturing an endless supply of surplus workers consumers and taxpayers to export to other nations so they can remain addicted to growth. That is just not the model <laughs> that we need to be following in the 21st century. We're living through the end of growth. Policymakers need to accept that. And efforts to delay this work against the rights of our children to live on a planet worth inheriting. Now, clearly we've got our work cut out for us. Quick summary. We can't get where we need to go just by reining in consumption or just with some hoped for technological miracles. They're not enough. We need to pull all three of these levers. I can't underscore enough that we can do this right and we must do it right. But how we talk about it is critical because it has so much emotional baggage attached to it. We have got to end the silence. We must acknowledge it and talk about it. You can make a difference in your own family size decisions, in supporting family planning in your community and around the world, and in enlightening elected representatives, journalists, friends, family, and colleagues. At World Population Balance, we don't deny the need to rein in our overconsumption, but we recognize that there are too few championing overpopulation awareness and solutions. So that's where we put our focus, to stand up for the underdog contracting our population. Now we've got a number of initiatives underway and these are to support you 
as a sustainable population activist, if that's what you choose to be. Uh, so take advantage of these, use these tools to help spread awareness and enlightenment and inspire loving, informed family size decisions. We really appreciate your help in this cause. All right, uh, I think we do have plenty of time for some conversation, which I look forward to. Well done, Dave. I thought that was a magnificent presentation. Very colorful, some great slides there. And as I say, I remind you all that this has been recorded and should all become available on our Science This Morning website and probably even our Planet in Crisis website if we keep it running because we have more events planned. Anyway, um, I, we've got a good half hour we can allot for questions here. Uh, there's not a vast number. Um, I, I got in very quickly, so I might as well deal with this because you mentioned the IPAC equation, Dave, and the balance between uh, population and consumption, but technology does come into it. If you were asked to apportion a percentage um, of how many times basically technological advance actually increases consumption rather than does something to improve efficiency and reduces consumption, how often does it happen? <laughs> Well, I don't, I'm not prepared to give you a figure, but that's precisely why I've chosen to leave that out uh, when I talk about this subject. And uh, I left that out, pretty much ignored that in my uh, film, Growth Buster Swift on Growth, which I want to thank uh, Scientists Warning Europe for uh, offering that film free this, this week. Um, technology, you know, the more I learn about renewable technology, which I'm a big proponent of. Uh, I, I don't think we can move to it quickly enough, but the more I learn about it, the more I discover that it is uh, uh, so woefully inadequate. It is, it, you know, we cannot run this crazy juggernaut that we've created on renewable energy and, and get out of trouble at all. Uh, Robin Maynard in his presentation men mentioned Jevons paradox that the cheaper uh, technology uh, makes some resource, the more of it we, we tend to use. And uh, I look at technology as a kind of a Pandora's box. Uh, uh, technology has given us a long list of things that we wish we hadn't uh, discovered, uh, DDT, uh, asbestos. Uh, PFAS, the uh, the forever chemical. Um, there's so many unintended consequences of technology, and when it comes to carbon emissions and renewable energy, the uh, the mining that's necessary, the resources that are required, the disposal of the waste, um, there are just an awful lot of uh, a lot of a lot of as many downsides as there are upsides, and that's why I just strongly resist any. Uh, anyone who thinks that we can ignore the uncomfortable and not skinny up our lives and not address overpopulation and just embrace renewable technology, not going to work. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to actually make a plug for a talk on Saturday. Um, Mike Sparrow uh, is talking about the juggernaut of 5G, which clearly react, impinges on this. Uh, you know, basically, if you're going to move from 4G phones to 5G phones, you're going to have to have a new phone, and you're going to have some more masks, and then you're going to have some more power consumption. You're going to make some, get some more materials out of the ground to make the phones. But then you've got to have, 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 have um, powerful servers to serve this massive amount of extra data that can be moved around even faster. Well, we have listened to that talk. Um, I'll move on to the next question now, but that's just a plug for one of our talks later on this week. Let me just mention, you know, there are some real good efforts underway to, uh, you know, to help us with skinnying up our lives. You know, there are people promoting the circular economy and being much more efficient and eliminating waste. But if you've got a circular economy, if you could really pull that off perfectly and you can't, there's always going to be leaks from that. But let's say you could do that leak free. If you're growing anything, then the circular economy has to grow too. Uh, so you're you know, right back where you started from. All right, for the next question, that's a clear question. Um, so there was an attempt to do a survey about how many of us given up flying. I think a lot of us ducked out of that because we're probably still guilty. <laughs> anyway, um, Johnny Payne's asked, well, I'm skeptical that cutting population in half will halve flights. Is this true? 
isn't the majority of population increase in the developing world while the majority sorry isn't the majority of population are ah, increased in the developing world yeah whilst the majority of flights are in the developed world you've got that name and i shall I read it again yeah, yeah, I kind of figured that I might get challenged on that. And yeah, that's that's true. Uh, I was pretty pretty well speaking in very general conceptual terms, and it really wouldn't. I don't think if we cut the world's population in half, we would end up with exactly 50% of the of the flights, but uh, we would end up with a lot less flights. I mean, you know, none of these big bad businesses, these big corporations that everyone's waiting for, uh, uh, for them to do something to get us out of this a dilemma we're in, you know, they, we have so much power, you know, we have the power because we're the customers and they do not exist without customers. I'll just say that. Yes, I suppose it's a, a difficult observation to make, but if you actually wanted to halve the population, which half would you halve? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you can cut the, what, those who are consuming the most out without damaging the whole global economy, because they seem to be running the show. <laughs> That's all I've got, got to say on that one. It's not my place to say. Well, let me, let, let me make a quick comment about that. You know, we've been challenged. People say, why are you running these billboard campaigns in uh, the overdeveloped world, like, like in Vancouver, Canada, where the birth rate is well below uh, replacement rate? And, and we, we think it's important because every child born in the overdeveloped world will have 20 to 60 times the impact of a child born in, in the developing world. So just because you live in a nation that has a fertility rate below replacement level, that doesn't mean you haven't, that doesn't mean that you have solved overpopulation. You've, you've, you've only solved overpopulation if you are all living these very simple lives uh, to where you aren't in overshoot, according to the Global Footprint Network's analysis. Can I just, can you hear me there, Dave? I just yes. wanted to add a couple of points. I've got a, qu a question here from Peter Blois, and it, it's touching again on the thorny subject of immigration. He, and he says, what are your thoughts on immigration into high consuming countries, given that um, such a lot of uh, population increase is driven by large-scale immigration and you mentioned the case of Canada but can you say a little more on that I mean how do we convince politicians that um, it's not a good idea to encourage hyper economic growth and hyper immigration you know I um, world population balance doesn't take a position on immigration because we want people it's such a polarized subject we want people on all sides of that issue to first get a basic fundamental understanding that we are overpopulated. Uh, it's got to start with that. And I have yet to see a conversation about uh, immigration uh, have all of the elements that a really productive conversation needs to have. Um, I am particularly, I find it particularly offensive what Canada is doing. They just recently raised their quota for, for immigrants. And it doesn't seem to be at all motivated by uh, let's help these people in the world who need help. It is all about let's, we have got to keep driving economic growth in Canada. We can't get our women to produce more babies, workers, consumers, taxpayers. So let's exploit some, some migrants. Uh, they, they are engaging in what's been called a global war for talent to steal the most talented people from other countries, import them into Canada so that Canada can have perpetual economic growth. Um, you, I just think, you know, as I mentioned in my re prepared remarks, you know, we just need to kind of get over that. Uh, I don't, I just find it offensive to exploit immigrants uh, as economic pawns to drive economic growth. I think there's room for compassion in your immigration decisions. But I also don't think that you can sit, we can't sit here fat and happy in the overdeveloped world, over consuming like crazy and just say, hey, we got ours, you can't have yours. Uh, stay away, don't come to my country and stay poor. That is not a good way forward either. So it's a complicated it's a complicated public discussion that needs to happen. Of course, of course another thing that um, a lot of politicians and business people miss is that they see Canada and Australia as huge countries 
with relatively small populations and think, oh, plenty of room to grow. But of course, mo much of Canada is in the Arctic tundra zone, the, the vast um, percentage of it is. And similarly in Australia, they say, oh, it's a big country with a small population. But only about 6% of Australia is fertile, habitable land. The rest is, the rest is desert. So p people, politicians and others just forget this. Yeah, and I might mention that, um, you know, it, we, we think that we are being compassionate when we uh, when we welcome people into our country. And there is certainly a degree of compassion there and there's a, a role for that. But I think we're also missing the point that we are uh, we're addicted. We're addicted to a lifestyle that is unsustainable and we're going to have to change it. You know, the uh, over here in North America, where I am, you know, it's called the American dream. You know why everyone wants to come to America and pursue the American dream. Well, the American dream is a nightmare, it turns out. We are all going to have to change our ways. And so in a way, it's false advertising for us to entice someone from the developing world to move into our country and say, come on in and pursue the American dream. Because what you're really saying is, come on in and become an addict, and we're all going to have to go cold turkey together. Uh, so in, in many ways, the world would benefit if we would reverse the migration pattern. I think we in the overdeveloped world ought to be migrating to the developing world where they are living more simply. And we might learn something about what really counts in life. And it is not, you know, buying the new uh, Hummer EV. Yeah, mm -hmm. this uh, going back to your uh, innovative billboard campaign, Margaret Beasley says that in fact, Apparently in, in Jakarta, Indonesia in 1975, they had a very effective uh, contraception billboard campaign. And I never knew that, but it's, so it shows that these things can happen in countries which have relatively successfully curbed their high level of um, high level birth rates. Indonesia has done better than India and places like that in curbing high birth rates, but uh, it still has a huge population issue. You know, the country that's most famous for having undertaken a, a fertility rate reduction project is Thailand. Uh, back in the 60s, they, they began and they really achieved dramatic uh, reduction in birth rates and rose out of poverty as a result of that. You know, they didn't just do a billboard campaign. And I, and I think that's one thing that we have learned from the campaigns we've run so far is this is a difficult subject to introduce to someone. It is hard for people to wrap their heads around the fact that we are overpopulated. So a bumper sticker or a billboard is a tough introduction to that. Now we put together a really strong website, oneplanetonechild.org. If you just go through the homepage, uh, it's really well put together, but you can't count on everyone who sees a bumper sticker or a billboard to go uh, visit that page. So, um, you know, I don't think we've necessarily found the, the, the perfect introduction for people. You know, we're, we're busy discussing that right now. We're looking for other ways to introduce people to this subject because it could be that something, you know, if you've got seven words or less, it's hard to be successful with that. Well, I'll just take it. I take in it. here with a question that's really more related to our planet in crisis and the climate change issue, although everything's connected. Um, this is our um, managing director, Ed, wanted to um, put this one in, and it's right near the beginning, so we better deal with it in fairness. The statement on population from the World Scientist Warning of Climate Emergency says, um, sorry, I picked up one, I beg your pardon. I've lost my place, apologies for that, uh, just a second. Right, sorry. Looking at the bubbles and considering the immediate UN goal of one and a half, two degrees within 10 years, he's asking, can I save more CO2 emissions in the next 10 years by only if A, I don't have a child, who will go from age naught to 10 years with commensurate consumption, or B, if I decide to not drive and fly and eat no meat. I think a lot of us are asking what these trade-offs are and what can I achieve the most. I bet that I know Dave's answer. Come on, Dave. <laughs> Both. What's up? So that's an awesome question. It really is uh, that I really haven't that I haven't answered fully. Um, well, but you know, by not adding another person to the planet, you let's say you take you take the carbon footprint of all of these. Let's just take the actions in that Lund University survey, the carbon footprint of driving a car 
which you can you can zero years out or re greatly reduce that. Uh, the carbon footprint of uh, heating or cooling uh, the place where you live, you can't zero that out, but you can reduce that. You can shrink your carbon footprint by re reusing and recycling, although recycling has very little uh, real benefit these days. There's so many problems with that. Uh, you, can, you can't zero out all of your carbon footprint. You can reduce it, but when you when you choose not to add another human being, those are every one of those is zero. They are zero for that human being. You don't have to hope that that next human being is going to be an environmentalist and be, uh, you know, a good citizen of the planet and try to live a, a, a simple life. It's a zero carbon footprint life. Year one, year two, year three, year four. Just think about what happens when a couple is expecting. What do they do? Well, in many cases, they buy a bigger house. Uh, in many cases, they, uh, they decorate and furnish a nursery. They, uh, you know, they, the purchases begin before the baby is even born. They make multiple vehicle trips to the OBGYN. And uh, probably for every 10 uh, deliveries that the OBGYN does, he and, or she and their family have a vacation in, in Mexico. I mean, the carbon footprint's just astounding. Yeah, I, there's another point raised uh, earlier by Ro uh, Rosalind Kent, and um, that's she said that um, politicians have the power to do something. How on earth are we going to influence them strongly enough in the time frame we've got left? And this is something that isn't really looked up at, at enough. It looks as though we can just sort of gradually, slowly, slowly make a gradual change to influence people in the hope that we will reach a sustainable trajectory in time. But one of the things I hope we can show from this Scientist Warning Conference Week is that um, there's a huge number of interrelated factors which are uh, making the time for action narrower and narrower. And I um, just wonder what you say on that. How do we sort of get this idea that things have got to happen really quickly? We can't have COP climate conferences going on year after year after year kicking the can down the road. Well, it's true that, uh, you know, it may be too late for some of the things that uh, that I think are really feasible. For example, I, how I wish that we had really addressed uh, the overpopulation issue 100 years ago. We should have started 100 years ago. We should have started 150 years ago, uh, but we didn't. Uh, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't start now, even though a lot of the benefits are going to be well into the future. We've got to start now. There's no cost to to getting that started. Uh, on the on the politicians, uh, vote for sure. But don't you wish that the policymakers that are in elected positions today were raised in families that really practiced a really strong environmental ethic? You know, we the the, the young people today who are in their twenties are uh, when they are in power. <laughs> they're going to have grown up understanding overshoot and overstanding uh, climate change, and they'll be, it'll be so much easier for them to make the good decisions. It's hard to get the 50 and 60 year olds in policymaker positions today to, uh, you know, to think about what a post growth world looks like. So we've got to replace them as fast as we can, and we've got to lead. The more of us that are living uh, the, the change that we want to see in the world, uh, the quicker those politicians political leaders are going to step in behind us. You know, the, what's the old adage that a politician doesn't lead the parade? They they see which way the parade's going and then they jump in front. Uh, we've got to show them which way the parade is going. We have we have so much more agency and power than we think. Yeah, and world population balance is very much up front with its one child, one planet message as well, which... Um... But, but I'll be the first to say that uh, being a realist, if a, if a you know, if Joe Biden or Kamala Harris had called me, you know, they're hopefully being busy being elected to the White House here today in the United States. If they called me three months ago and said, T tell us a little bit about uh, over overshoot. What do we need to know? What do we need to, uh, what, what is our plank, uh, what does our platform need to say? I, I, I wouldn't say, tell everybody that uh, we're going to bring you the end of economic growth <laughs> <laughs> and that we're overpopulated and that we need to uh, start contracting our population. Why? Because they wouldn't be elected. Now, that is just a sad fact of life. 
we have got to work fast to change that reality somehow. But of course, the, the COVID crisis and the, the focus on a Green New Deal will create new ways of thinking and potentially millions of jobs. They will. But, you know, Joe Biden's been having to really backstep a lot over having in the, in the last debate, having talked about uh, eliminating the, the oil industry. You know, he, he, he's, he was honest for a moment and has been paying for that honesty. Uh, he could have spoken more eloquently and articulately about that. But it's, you know, the sad fact of life is that if you don't promise economic growth and jobs and and a rosier, a bigger life next year than this year, it's pretty tough to get elected. Indeed. Bill, did you pick up any more questions? Can I throw this one in? Um, it's another one from um, Ed Gemmell. Dave, do you really mean small families freely chosen is surely government tax incentives drive population growth reduction? If we provide good child care allowances for as many children as you like, then this encourages more births. And if you reduce child benefits or even increase taxes for extra children, then this will also reduce births i.e. we are saying governments can do something about this. How do we get them to do it? Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Right now, uh, pretty much around the world, we have pretty pro-natalist policies at work. And I've been doing a lot of thinking about that because it's a tricky position to take, to start saying we need to stop subsidizing large families and we need to somehow find ways to incentivize uh, and reward people who make small family decisions. And I think my suspicion is that the best way forward is to uh, provide really good uh, social safety net and social programs for uh, the first child that a family has. Because we, we don't wanna leave children, we don't want children to pay the penalty for uh, the kinds of policy changes we need to make. But we do, but I think we do need to start working on eliminating the subsidies for, for larger, larger families. Uh, I know in the UK, you guys have experimented with that a little bit, and I'd love to learn more about how that has gone. Um, but uh, based on the based on the public response to our Vancouver billboard campaign, I suspect that uh, the pushback is going to be pretty strong to any concerted effort to start changing these policies. First, we need to make sure everybody understands the dilemma that we're in. Indeed. Yeah. Uh, just so um, John Gillibo, John Gillibo asks you, and you may be able, may be able to answer this or have a view, an opinion. If Biden gets elected, do you think the global the global, is the global gag rule uh, will be eliminated or not? Oh, I'm quite sure it will be. I think it will. Yeah. Okay. And, so, and I apologize to the world. That's so sad. Mm. It's so sad what the U.S. has been doing. Can I throw this one in? Because it's from John McEwen, and it's really about the conflict between, even if you try and get the government on your side, you've got big business. I think you touched on this quite clearly, Dave. Um, you know, how can reducing birth rate in Canada achieve population reduction? when big business in Canada is strongly influenced the government to increase immigration, which is obviously they, they want more customers and they want more cheap labor. And this is a constant problem. And you did touch on this, I'm sure, in your talk. Um, it's a conflict. Yes. Yep. No question about it. And, um, you know, it's just uh, that's illiteracy. You know, it's uh, we really need to send every policymaker to uh, Dave Gardner University to take Population 101. <laughs> and, uh, you know, in the, in the last episode of the Overpopulation podcast, we actually called that episode, I think, Overpo Overpopulation 101 for politicians. And we made a cute graph that looked like a, you know, a list of courses that uh, politicians could take. And it was fun just dreaming up the titles of all these courses, you know, uh, pol the policymakers today just lack uh, even a halfway comprehensive understanding of overshoot and sustainability. And we've got to find ways to uh, to educate them. Yeah, just um, uh, going back. Here, please, just a, as a rider on top of that. Look, there's another excellent event that Dave Gardner is very closely connected with. All, well, for the rest of this week, you can watch Dave Garner's Growth Busters, 
hooked on growth movie for free on our Planet in Crisis website. Will Saunders has put the link, but you just need to go to the site. You'll find it on the homepage. You can watch it for free. It runs for 54 minutes. It's all about growth and how badly we need to stop it. Um, Dave is actually the chief executive of Growth Buses. He runs a super series of, um, well, you have to listen rather than watch for a change. They call uh, podcasts, <laughs> but they're excellent and they're well worth getting involved with. Do watch the movie. Yeah, just uh, um, to remind everyone that um, tomorrow will be Energy Day and uh, energy, our energy consumption is another huge issue. Um, the day starts quite early at 10 a.m. UK time, and there'll be a full day of talks on the on the challenge of building a low carbon sustainable energy infrastructure. And we're opening with Professor Chris, Chris Rhodes at 10, 10 a.m. UK time. And really, energy underpins our society in every way. It is taken for granted by people, but it gives us lighting, transport, construction, jobs, communities, food production and distribution. And without enough energy, our world would come to a halt. So I do hope as many of you as possible will join our energy theme day tomorrow. So I don't know, I don't know whether we've just about come to the end of all questions now, but thanks again very much, Dave, for your um, thoughts from Colorado and um, the work of World Population Balance. And I hope people go and take a much closer look at what you're doing. Well, double those thanks to uh, Scientists Warning Europe and the, the work that you're doing. I cannot thank you enough. I just pasted in the chat uh, links to some of the main initiatives that World Population Balance is uh, undertaking. Like I said, these are tools to uh, support people who want to try to make a difference in this.